with all this trade war stuff going on, I want to explain why China thinks that unfair trade is fair. And I'll explain why this is, is what, you know, the details of what's happening with China and what's going on with Taiwan, because it's similar. There's an overlap. And of course, I'm going to talk about my own story because Chinese culture doesn't get the concept of the golden rule historically. That, that's a Western thing. Jesus was over in Israel that we're talking Greco-Roman empire era. Uh, Christendom went into Europe. Well, Ch China was, you know, way on the other side of the world. The concept of the golden rule, love your neighbor as yourself, it did not occur to them. Like it wasn't, it just, it, it wasn't part of their thinking. China views itself as the center of the universe. And they really believe that they are entitled to receive anything and everything extra. They, they really genuinely believe this. They will tell you this, that it is right and fair and good. It is, this is not one of those subconscious things that they think that they don't know that they think. They know they think this. They argue for it. They get up and give speeches about it. China is the center of the universe. They really, really believe it. And because they really, really believe it, you should also. Because they really, really believe it. Now, what you really, really believe, they don't, they don't have to believe what you really, really believe. Because you're not Chinese. But they're Chinese, so you should believe them. Now, <laughs> now there, there's, there's a lot of people say, well, you know, that's a cultural difference. No, it's not a cultural difference. A more appropriate term is childish. This is an immature culture that doesn't have a lot of experience with other people. That's what's going on here. And, I, and I've, I've talked about the, the PD, uh, the, the personality disorder of shame, the shame personality disorder consortium. It's, it's this mesh of personality disorders. China genuinely believes, now this goes back to the opium wars. The whole world should be a financial economic funnel of, of, of wealth, of ideas, of technology, of good things flowing down into them one way. Everything, money, everything should flow into China. Your inventions and ideas in America should go over to China. They should have the patent on it. You shouldn't be able to use it in America. They should be the ones processing it. They should be the ones making it, selling it, making all the money from it because they're worthy, because they're China. Not because they did the work and because they, they did the hard times and, you know, no. They're China, so they're worthy. All right. This, this, this trade thing, Trump wanting to have a level playing field where the money going in and out of America to and from China is equal as the money going in and out to and from China from America. Okay. That, that there should be equal going back and forth. They think that's unfair. They believe that it's only fair if more money is going in, in the trade deal. There should be a hundred billion U.S. dollar trade surplus in China's favor, or it's not fair, and they believe this. If we were to use weigh scales, China would argue, my dish in the weigh scale should be five centimeters higher than yours. Like, that's how they view life. Okay. All right. Um, I, I mean, I, really, like, th this is not, like, I know, I know. It's like, Jesse, are you, what? Really? Yes. And that goes back to the opium wars. You know, the, the British had approached China. They'd gone with their gadgets and inventions. The emperor didn't want it. The people did. The rich, I mean, owning a cuckoo clock from England was a big thing for rich people. But it was outlawed from the emperor. The only thing China would, would sell to, you know, um, you know, China would, would sell tea. 
you know they grow leaves on 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 the on the tea on the on the the the, the tea plants the tea trees the leaves go over to to England they they grow back you know within a few weeks and they sell more leaves and the silver from England keeps going one way into China there's nothing reciprocal well, that's when England decided they were going to start selling opium See, I, you know, the, the, the entire drug market, the opium market in China, arguably, was created because China didn't want anything reciprocal. It was selfish. So they got mad and, and you know, you can look up the opium wars and where that, that led to. But the, the, the thing is, China's always believed that a one-way flow of money, silver, coins, and all that going into China is fair and good. All right. Okay. Let's take this and let's talk about Taiwan. In America, if a Taiwanese citizen lives in America and is employed, or they've got a green card for five years, they're in America five years, they got the green card. After five years, they can become a U.S. citizen and get a U.S. passport. Can an American citizen go to Taiwan, get the equivalent of a green card, a resident alien residence card, ARC, for five years and after five years become a Taiwanese citizen and get a Taiwan passport? Can they? No. Nope. Now, despite this, two things are unimaginable despite this. One, the arrogant, selfish gall of Taiwan and the incompetent silence of Congress and even the White House. Nobody mentions this. Taiwan wants free trade with America. They want to have the only, what would be the only, they're not asking about the only, but it would be the only exception on being able to sell goods that have China farther back in the supply chain to America without having to pay tariffs. They want that free trade. But why aren't they being fair with other stuff? Why didn't they try to fix this passport thing? Why don't they let Americans become Taiwanese citizens? They, they don't do it. There's no, no effort, no attempt. They don't think about it. They didn't say, hey, guess what? We'll be fair on this, this passport thing. We'll go make that law fair. So would you give us free trade? But that, right now, it's not fair. We need to make it fair anyway. We're going we're gonna to let Americans get Taiwanese passports. We're going to do that anyway. Maybe, maybe America would consider letting us have fair trade or free trade, excuse me. Not fair trade. Fair trade's another thing. But they don't do that. And America doesn't call them out on it. Okay. I'm going to elaborate a little bit of this. And I'm going to talk about my own experience in Taiwan. I've always said I've, I've had bad experience. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my experiences in Taiwan. But first, I'm going to drink some of this water. Because you've got to have water. I hope that you drink water. You know, I think that taking podcast time to drink water is, uh, is, is a positive influence. Look, there's no way that I could take as much time drinking water on the podcast as everyone should take time drinking water throughout the day. I came to Taiwan pushing 10 years ago. I'm in my 10th year. If it was a state in the United States, I would have already qualified for residency 10 years in a row. I came here, my first boss tried to take my passport and I had to argue with him to get my work permit. My second boss would not let me have my work permit. Now, why is a work permit important? You have to apply for it, it's gotta be legal, but I have to have it. I'm legally required to be in possession of it. After, in Taiwan, after five years, current law, five years of continuous employment. Now, you can have days off, but you're still considered employed. Five years of continuous employment. No, not even a single day between jobs where you're unemployed. It's got to be seamless. 
You've already got another job. After five years of continuous employment, not even, not even, not even a speeding ticket, not so much as a speeding ticket for a criminal record. Even the most minor of traffic violations, you can't have any of those. And if you've been earning above average income for five continuous years, then the, the foreigner can get uh, an, a PARC, a permanent residence card, and they can work wherever they want. Well, then they have to go through another loop to get a work license. And a lot of them don't know that. But then they can work wherever they want after that. All right. Now, typically in America, that would be passport, but they do this residence card thing. And you have to be in the country for a lot of the time in order for it to renew and that sort of thing. All right. You only get that card if you have all of the work permits from that time. So by my, my second employer, by refusing to give me my work permit, they were, they were denying me that year of working that I had that could count toward that residence card. You with, with me? By not giving me my work permit, they're taking away my ability to apply for a card, a, a type of resident status that, that's my right to apply for under the law. Okay, this is a problem, right? Okay, no problem, right? I mean, no one would do that because I can call a lawyer, I can call the police, I have an investigation, right? Right. Okay, right. 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 It should, shouldn't be a problem, right? Okay. Well, the government sends the work permit to the employer and it's the employer's responsibility to give it to the foreigner. Never at a border crossing, never at an immigration office where you have to go through the process of applying, never do they ever ask, is the foreigner in possession of the work permit? Show me. Show me where the foreigner has possession of the work permit. Okay, foreigner, you have to keep that work permit. If your employer even tries to take it away from you, you come call us and we'll send the police and at least find them. You must stay in possession of that. We're glad to see that you are. They never do this. They don't mail it to the residents. They mail it to the boss. I called immigration and I said, my employer will not give me my work permit. They refuse. Immigration said they have to and hung up the phone. Okay. All right. Uh, now, after I have the recording of the employee, because things were heating up, I had the recording of the, the, the boss supervisor, the big wig saying to me, after this, I hate foreigners. I hate foreigners. That, that's me. I'm the foreigner. And I think that Chinese teachers are the best. Foreign teachers don't know how to teach. Chinese teachers are the best. I think, I think Chinese teachers are best. So I have this. I send a recording of this to the government. Now, technically, that's illegal for me to record it. What should be more illegal? Now, the problem with recording private conversations is you have to have a plaintiff if you're going to prosecute. You have to identify who that other person is. Now, is, is the, I even took this recording to a lawyer and the lawyer in Taiwan said, you know, the government's not going to do anything with that, but you could create problems by sending it to a newspaper. You know, that's a thing. Um, that, but I didn't do that. All right. Shortly after that conversation, I, the, the employer was doing other things to harass me. I have some video footage from a classroom, actually. What, 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 <laughs> oh, it's a crazy story. They wasted an entire class and had the kids start shouting stuff in Chinese uh, to try to make me look bad. Like it was, it was, it was all theatrics. Terrible. I went to the employer. Now, follow me on this. When a foreigner in Taiwan quits the job, the foreigner, there's, there's been an application process, work permit, licensure, all kinds of stuff already. When the foreigner quits that job, 
the employer is legally required to fill out a piece of paper that says the foreigner came to me and told me that the foreigner wants to quit. I recognize that he came to me and wants to quit and stamp it with the company stamp because they don't, I mean, it's from an illiterate society. They don't sign signatures. They have unique stamps, like unique, like there's only one of a kind stamps. Stamp it and then the foreigner is supposed to take that to the government. I said, I quit. I sent an email to the company and said, I quit. And they would not give me that paper. Now, I'd gotten that paper from a previous employer. The very interesting, wild story about that. So I went to the police. The local police station gave them the card. I said, I want to quit. They called the bigwig supervisor. Supervisor came sat in front of me for 10, 20 minutes, did nothing, and then left. Just didn't do anything. And the police said, well, come back on Wednesday. So they came back on Wednesday. Nothing. Still would not give me the paper. I went to the police station twice to try to resign and quit properly, and they still wouldn't do it properly. Well, then... You know, if a foreigner doesn't, doesn't quit, doesn't, you know, go to the employer, if a foreigner wants to quit, doesn't go, doesn't do that, doesn't get that paper. If they don't do that, then the employer is legally required to send a letter to the government that says that employer just quit MIA. They're, they're MIA, they're AWOL, they're gone. They just up and vanished. Okay. Well, my employer lied and said that I went MIA and up and vanished. They filed that paper. I have the original at home in America. And the government actually entertained that false accusation, even though I had gone to the police station twice and the employer was there both times as I was trying to quit. And I had the emails trying to quit. I've got, I've got emails. There's no, it, the government should have said, wait, um, he was at a police station twice. He sent you an email. What you're saying is a lie. We're sending the police to investigate you and we're going to fine you for, for sending false. You know, this, is, this, is, this is a false accusation. And they should have fined the employer. They didn't. The government entertained that false accusation, which they knew was false, and summoned me to an informal uh, meeting. It wasn't so much a hearing, it was a meeting. Now, because I was patient and I had one friend that would help me, we actually negotiated through that and that I was the first foreigner in Taiwan to ever come to a, an agreement with uh, the employer when there was a dispute. That, that was a big deal. That was a really big deal to that government. They had never done that before. That kind of encouraged them that they could handle foreign stuff with foreigners. I'm not, I'm not a buffoon. I was, I was the first guy to actually make peace with it. So it's not like I'm, I'm unpeaceable. Like I can't have peace. I can't, I can have peace. All right. That's part of a bigger problem of what I've called, I've already established the third world legal system in Taiwan. It's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly selfish how Taiwan operates. They have requirements. They don't have, I mean, I, I was telling someone recently, should, should, the word should does not enforce the law. That's the reason we have police. The employer should give me the work permit. Well, that, that doesn't do anything. You've got to have a device in place to enforce the law. And the Taiwanese don't get that. Or maybe they do get it. Here's what happened after I, I finally left that job. See, as I've explained, Taiwan has the 14666 video. If you can pay it, people listen to me talk and it's like they don't hear what I'm saying. So you've got to watch the video maybe two, three, five, two hundred times and pay attention to what I'm saying. Because of the minimum hour requirements and the, the complex, weird, arbitrary requirements, it makes sense from the government's perspective of being ultra lazy and making all standards coterminous and identical so that the government can be lazy in the bureaucracy. But in real life, their weird, arbitrary requirements don't fit reality, and that creates an English black market. 
in Tainan anyway, and in a variety of places throughout Taiwan, most normal marketable English teaching, ESL, is a black market because of weird laws that don't make sense outlawing this and that little thing and you got to have this and none of those things can ever happen economically. So it creates a de facto black market. It's not like prohibition where they say alcohol is illegal. It's, it's like this complicated thing. You're like, you're not allowed, like, like alcohol can only be made in this economic, in this city, in this township. And the person in this township has to have a net income of 1 million US dollars every year. And by the way, in this township, no one has that income. And then they have to pay like, like, like they're not allowed to charge more than, you know, $2 a bottle, but they're required to pay per bottle $3 in taxes. Like, like it's kind of sort of like that. And it, it, it basically results in a black market in Taiwan. Now the government, what? I don't think so. And then they walk away and they, they don't deal with it. But because of what I explained in the 14666 video, early in the, the Taiwan special series, that creates a black market. Okay. All right. So there's a black market. As it turns out, the guy who went to the government and defended me when, when rather than me being deported on false charges, which happens a lot in Taiwan, if you can imagine. And rather than me having a rich mom and dad at home who hire a Taiwan lawyer to sue my boss, which happens once in a while, I, it's, I, you know, as I understand, the guy that helped me get that agreement with my employer tells me, Jesse, I know how stuff works in Taiwan. And the part you need to know is that your employer is the mafia of the black market. See all those English schools that can't meet those ridiculous hourly requirements in order to get a native speaker, they give illegal under the table money to your employer. Your employer is the mafia, Don. They give illegal under the table money to your employer and your employer goes and finds a foreigner, fills out fake paperwork, meeting fake hour requirements for their, uh, to give them a, 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 a residence card and a work permit, but it's all, it's lying saying they meet the minimum hours when they don't. And then the foreigner can get a work permit and the foreigner can get, uh, an, a, a card and a residence card, and then they're able to work, but it's all a lie. And people are paying this under the table money to get that. And then your employer goes to their friends in government. They call their politicians. They call their bureaucrats to not enforce the law so that those foreigners don't get deported. Now your employer, I mean, my, my, my you know, okay, I'm talking, he was, he told me that he explained that to me. He said, yours is the school that all the other little schools go to, to get that. Your, your employer is big in the black market business for, for getting uh, ESL teachers on, 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 you know, false, fake, fake employment. Now, my employer also had their own set of English schools. So because they could do this, they could tip that, you know, they could game the system in their favor. And also the local English schools had like a, a group, like there was a board of the different English schools that would come together. The English, we're talking ESL schools. Uh, my employer played an important role on that. I'm not going to say what role. I'm not going to get into too many details. All right. That's part of the unfair system that's been happening in Taiwan. Now, how does this all relate to what I talked about earlier in the podcast about China thinking that cash and money and ideas should flow in one way? Taiwan gets its cultural paradigm, its, its worldview from China. And it, it, it's like the American colonies came from England. So English is their language and a lot of other stuff. When we do things differently in America, it's because we didn't want it done the way it was done in England. You know, like, like there's, there's a history there to the culture one way or another. Now, Taiwan does this because they have the thinking 
that everything should be one way flowing into their favor. And so they just don't think about the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. They just don't think about that. So Taiwan's going to America asking for free trade, but they've got these skeletons in their closet. As another, I mean, one blatant example is the policy about passports. They've got these skeletons in their closets, but they're not willing to. Um, they're not willing to deal with them. They're not willing to clean out the closet, but they are willing to ask for free trade. Now, it is possible for an American to get a Taiwanese passport, but you have to renounce your American citizenship and then wait in Taiwan without a citizenship for one year. And you're in Taiwan and you're not a citizen anywhere for a year first. <laughs> that's all right. So that's the one way street. And that's, that's the paradigm that's going on that. I mean, I, in, I mean, in China, it's worse. You know, I mean, the part I forgot to say, I'm, I'm thinking about this story. My, I explained my employer a, was, was the black market mafia Don because of their position in the market. If I would go apply at an English job, they would know about it. And so they would follow me around and harass me and keep me from getting that. Now, I, like, I couldn't get another job in Taiwan because of that. Now, you'd think like, wait a minute, can't you like hire an investigator? It's like, wait a minute, dude, we're talking on the other side of the world. Grab, you know, water flows uphill, like things are opposite here. This is a third world legal system. And, and this, is, this is a thing, like you need to know this, this is a thing. Chinese culture will attack people like a pack of hyenas. I don't know if you've seen videos, search YouTube, you know, search the internet, look for hyenas attacking an animal. It's like this weird gang attack. It's really weird and terrible. It's horrifying to watch Chinese culture. We're talking China, Taiwan. They do this. Taiwanese, a, a Taiwanese English school will set up an English school in China. They'll write their own curriculum. They'll set up their own school. And within a few months, people that were English students in China will take the books that they bought, do high quality photocopies, completely copy the entire curriculum, build a, a, a newer looking better school and charge less money and steal all the customers. Now they don't know how to actually teach English because they didn't write the curriculum. It's not as good quality, but because they're Chinese that don't know how to invent stuff, they only copy and reverse engineer. They don't know it. And the Chinese students don't know that the copy fake school isn't as good as the original one. So Taiwanese won't go do business in China. This is a problem doing business in China. They'll also do the hyena style attack. Like they'll do black market stuff. They'll have, you know, local government will send investigators on false accusations and just investigate, investigate, investigate you until you can't, you're financially done. And now there's a copy, a clone of your school in China making all the money and you lost a whole bunch. This would happen all the time when, when the United States would talk about international copyright law, intellectual property, that's what was going on. It's that it's not just copying it stuff. It's 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 part of a greater hyena attack, a hyena style attack. Well, there's a lot more that I could say about this. I'm going to get to that in the next video because I'm already double my time.